there's no faking it. There's no faking martial arts training. Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 460. Today, my guest is Mr. Philip Hartzor. Who am I? I'm Jeremy. Jeremy Lesniak, host for Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, founder at Whistlekick. And you can see everything that we've got going on, all the things I'm spending my time on beyond this show and the rest of the team are spending their time on at whistlekick.com. There you'll find links to all the things that we've got going and you'll see a store. Pop into the store, make a purchase, support the show, support our work at Whistlekick and use the code podcast15 so we know that you made that purchase because you're listening to the show. We do this show twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. Monday's a guest interview, Thursday's a topic-driven show, and you can find every single episode we've ever done all for free at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com in addition to your podcast feeds or YouTube or anywhere else you might think of. You can sign up for the newsletter on either website, and that'll keep you informed of all the things we've got going. Why do we do what we do? We do it all for you, for the traditional martial artist, we're looking to connect with you, to inspire you, to educate you, to support you and your martial arts lifestyle. But let's talk about today's guest. Mr. Hartshorn has a lot going on, and I don't think I can explain it any better. There's a lot to this man, and we talk about much of it. I can't even say that we talk about all of it because there's too much. And that's not a bad thing. He openly shares stories and anecdotes and places he's been and going. And it was just a wonderful conversation. And I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure you will too. Mr. Hartshorn, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello. It's a pleasure. Hey, thanks for, thanks for doing this. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> it's always an honor to talk to somebody with a really great mic. <laughs> which I'm sure the listeners are like, um, really? And, and it is, it is. And I can tell the moment I start the conversation with someone, because I, I think most of the listeners know, but in case people don't know, we have a few minutes of conversation. We talk about what's going to happen and how this goes. And once in a great while, we'll just roll into, into the show. But most of the time, you know, we, we chat and make sure things are going right. And the moment I heard you say, can you hear me? I was like, ah, great audio quality. This one's going to be great. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, it does make a difference. It really does. It does. It does. It, it. And if you go listen to any random podcast, most of them don't have good audio quality. No, and, it, no, and it's, it's unfortunate. Terrible. And it, it sucks. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is where I, where I shout out Julius for doing the great work he does on the back end and saying, "All right, hey, Julius, you know, Julius kills it with <laughs> with the audio and uh, the legend." Early, he made me get a better mic early on. He was like, "Hey." Um, we need to fix some of these things. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That sounds great. So. Thank you. Thank you. And you, and you sound great too. Man, this is, this is uh, probably the fluffiest opening I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, we, we talked about a bunch of things just now and, and I know we're going to get into a lot of them. And what I'm looking forward to in this conversation is how I'm expecting we're going to spider off into a bunch of different things. But let's, let's get that foundation down. Let's, let's talk about the martial arts core that you know, we're going to relate everything back to as we move forward. So how did, how did you get started as a martial artist? Well, I remember as a child uh, watching Star Wars and The Princess Bride and seeing these sword fights, these magnificent sword fights, these epic duels, and just saying, like, I really want a sword fight. I love the sword. You know, it's such a fascinating thing. And there's just, just unspoken language that occurs between two people, you know, exchanging blows. It's a different language, uh, perhaps more genuine language. Um, and so I started fencing and I was probably nine years old when I did this and I was very small, you know, very kind of frail child. And because of my age bracket, I was oftentimes going up against people who are a lot bigger than me, you know, either just, uh, their size or their age. Right. And, you know, if you've never fenced, you're getting smacked with a metal a chunk of metal, essentially. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's rather painful and uh, quite terrifying when you're a nine-year-old. So, you know, I wanted to learn the sword. And I remember it taught me the first sort of lesson of the martial ways, if you will. And it was, you know, I kept retreating. 
because I was getting hit by a metal. <laughs> I was leaving welts on my body by these people. Seems who Seems like a reasonable response. Yeah, people who were five years older than me, eight years older than me. I remember one guy was 18 and I was nine years old, twice my age. And uh, he was just attacking me. And it's a fascinating story. It's like this strange, almost Twilight Zone uh, story where his name was Phil as well. And he was 18, <laughs> he's twice my age. And it was almost like I was battling myself, you know, and he was uh, attacking me and I was going back and I kept retreating and going out of bounds. And then, you know, you lose, you, you lose a point. And I, my coach kept telling me, you know, my, my father, said, you have to, you have to attack, you have to move forward you have to face your enemy head on. And it kind of took this moment where I said, no, I'm, I'm just going to do this. It's going to hurt. Uh, but this is it. This is the journey. This is the way, this is life. I have to move forward. You have to take hits. Uh, you have to strike face your opponent head on. And it was a great lesson. So it sort of taught me that. Uh, so that was my start in martial arts. I did that for a few years and probably the most experience I have in competing, you know, in actual fighting people for years in fencing, going to competitions and just training every day. And then later in life, I got into probably my teenage years. I really loved the aesthetics of tricking, which I'm sure you know, this is it's sort of the aesthetic blend for our viewers of, of martial arts, flips, kicks, twists, and uh, it's very flashy. It's very beautiful. Uh, so I wanted to get into that just for the, you know, the movement. I love movement. And so I started training that, you know, got some basic kicks down and some flips. And after that, I said, you know, I really have the flashy stuff down. It's really beautiful, but, but I'd like to get something a little bit more gritty, a little bit more real. I kind of wanted to go the opposite way since I now had this, you know, sword fighting and flashy kicks and flips. So I said, uh, let's find something. And I got an opportunity to attend a Wing Chun class. I said, okay, this is Bruce Lee stuff. This is, you know, what if somebody stabs me in an alleyway? How do you come out of that alive? Right? It's not a competition like, like I had competed in where, okay, we stand equidistant from each other and let's salute with our swords. No, this is, this is the real thing. So it was a lot of fun. And uh, Wing Chun is very different. <laughs> it's very mean. It's very rude uh, and gritty. So as, as I'm sure you know from Bruce Lee, so it was, uh, or if you've seen the Yip Man movies, that was a fantastic experience in that it taught me a little bit more reality of the martial arts, uh, where I, I had grown up, you know, sort of this whimsical interest in Star Wars, The Princess Bride, these sword fights, uh, these sort of honorable exchanges. And then it, uh, as you get older, we tend to get a little bit more, uh, I wouldn't say jaded, but a little bit more, hmm, you sort of realize uh, the harsh realities of the world, right? So I said, let's, cynical? let's learn a that, bit of this. Is that a fair word? Yeah, I mean, you know, not to be negative, but you get, yeah, you get a little cynical, uh, even just realistically so. So it was a great uh, opportunity to learn that end of it. And still, you know, to find a code. And I think it's even more important to sort of have a code in that cynicism, right? It's not just uh, life is terrible. Be ready to kill anybody because everybody's terrible. No, 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 no. Let's, let's find a way to live in this chaos and uh, let's find some, some peace within it. So that was great. It was sort of the opposite. And uh, after that, I was just recently, uh, my, my journey has continued after Wing Chun. And a lot of people think it's all I practice because I think a lot of people are very dogmatic about their martial arts. I think it's a very American thing after going to China. But uh, I've trained many other things. I was recently in China living as a warrior monk in the Shaolin Temple and training at, uh, numerous other martial arts, which was an amazing experience. And uh, can we dig into that? I mean, that's that's not a absolutely. thing that, that we've talked about too much. I mean, uh, yeah. you're, you're almost glossing over, you know, I lived in the Shaolin Temple and I was a warrior monk for a minute, you know, and, uh, and yeah, and then I went and it had was... dinner. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how did anyway. that happen? How did you get that opportunity and, and why and, and what did you learn and everything? Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, life changing, of course. Well, earlier in the year, I had gone to climb to Mount Everest in Nepal with my dear friend, Spencer, who's fantastic. Uh, if you've seen any of my content, for those of you watching, you know who he is. He's in a lot of my videos. Amazing martial artist, uh, at least, you know, 15 years experience. And he had mentioned to me, hey, I, you know, he teaches Chinese. So he also, when he goes to train at the Shaolin Temple, he has connections in China. He is the translator. So he was kind of like, hey, you know, I can, you should come with me. It'd be fantastic. You know, you're my friend, so they'd welcome you in. And uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun. And because of my content, He's like, hey, you could, you could film and everybody would be happy. You could help promote it. You could train. It would be a lot of fun. So I joined Spencer and I went over for about a month. And yeah, we lived as warrior monks in the Shaolin Temple in Yunnan. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. 
much like the Everest trip. Uh, but it was probably harder, as strange as that sounds, <laughs> because it was, you know, true monastic living and eating. Uh, for example, you can't speak because it's, you know, Buddhist monks. You can't speak when you eat. You have to really appreciate every grain of rice. You can't throw anything out. If you're served any amount of food, you must consume it. Uh, it's incredibly offensive to throw it away. So it doesn't matter what you get. It could be spicy. It could taste like poison, but you must eat it. Uh, so that was just a very uh, fantastic experience. Uh, the meditation was another big one for me and probably the thing I was most excited to train over there as well. But besides that, we trained, of course, nine hours a day, extreme martial arts training, which I mean, I thought I was Mr. Fitness, you know, over here. Oh, I train a lot. No, no, not nine hours a day, though. So, so it's, yeah. it's nine hours of intense stuff. Yes. Yeah, like, like, very, like the level that most of us would expect in an hour class. You know, you come away, you're sweaty, you're tired. Yes. You do you that, have that nine hours a day. Yeah, you do that for three hours first in the morning uh, after breakfast. And then, you know, you get lunch, you do it again, <laughs> another three hours. Wow. And that's the, you go to eat, you know, and you have to eat with proper posture. Or, you know, this guy comes around with a wooden sword and smacks you in the back. Uh, you can't even cross your legs. You have to sit perfectly on this wooden bench. You get so, hit if you're eating wrong. Yes. What I just heard. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's, it's really the term warrior monk. I think a lot of people, even today, they say, oh, you know, warrior monk. What does that even mean anymore? There's no wars. And for me, the term warrior really is about discipline, right? If you say, like, I'm going to live the hard life of a warrior. What does that mean? It's, it's discipline. It's self-control, right? It's, it's resilience. And the fact that you eat with perfect posture. And I remember this, this is a great takeaway. Uh, somebody was kind of having bad posture when they're eating and they had to be talked to many times and you know, smacked with a wooden sword. And after the fact, uh, the Shifu of the Jalan Temple, Yan Jun Shifu, had a talk with everybody. And he was kind of like, as of course Spencer was translating, he pretty much said, you know, some of you have been a little bit confused that we're so stickler, we're such sticklers to, to eating properly. And then this point was so great. He says, how do you expect to learn or why should you be able to learn one of the most ancient and most difficult, intricate types of movement that the body's ever achieved when you can't even eat right? And it was just like, wow, that's a really good point. Right. But it takes incredible discipline. We're so used to just, you know, slacking off and chatting while we eat and, you know, crossing our legs and having terrible posture. Uh, it says a lot, I think, that we can't even eat correctly, yet we want to learn, you know, this cherished treasure of, uh, of movement, which is also incredibly difficult. Right. How do you expect to hold these stances from 3,000 years ago that are athletic achievements just to achieve them if you can't sit on a bench and eat? Right. So I thought it was a good point. Mm. How long were you there? Uh, about a month. Okay. I was there and it was just, it was very intense. Like I said, the training, I mean, you go picture like high intensity interval training, but there's no intervals. There's no breaks. That's, <laughs> that's all I can. It's just high intensity training forever. Uh, that's how I would describe it. And uh, you just, you know, it'd be ridiculous. Like, and there was a uh, different uh, type of training for each day of the week in the morning. And then later in the day, you would train different things. So you learned an incredible amount of different martial arts, which is why I loved it. And uh, for example, in the morning, you would have uh, power training, which is one of the most ridiculous workouts I've ever had in my life. And this is coming from someone who is you know, very into calisthenics, fitness, uh, and all the other variations of it, certified as a personal trainer, et cetera. And it just breaks you to the core. And it's just an absurd amount of, it's almost militaristic in the way they train you because they sort of find this breaking point, but then force you to go well beyond it. Right. So it would be something akin to it's like, Oh, do you know, 40 burpees. And you're like, what? Oh God. So you, you, you do the 40 burpees. Then it's like 30 more. And you're like, what? I'm dead. I can't do 30 more. And then it's like, you know, 50 more. And you're like, okay, I'm going to die now. And you just do it. Right. You, you, you find a way through because traditionally you would say, Oh, there's, there's no reason for this. This is going to bring injuries. This is not going to grow my muscles for, you know, whatever vain reason, uh, reason of training, but uh, it's a different purpose, right? It's sort of like, that's what I mean by the definition of a warrior. I think it's different than just training for fun. Uh, it's that absolute discipline and resilience to keep going. So it was a great lesson. 
a lot of people say, you know, it takes three weeks to cultivate a habit. And, you know, I've, I've read some conflicting stuff, but it, it seems like a good yeah. jumping off point for this question. You were there for a month. So what changed in, in you and your training and the way you approach, I guess, anything? Like, what was the outcome for you of being there? Uh, so much, so much. I mean, it's cliche to say, oh, it changed my life, but it was more the appreciation of the little things. And you know, I'm not some unappreciative slob, but something that you wouldn't expect, you don't really sit. It's not really possible to sit at the temple <laughs> because there's no chairs and there's some stone that you could sit on, but they say, it's like, no, 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 it's, it's bad for your chi. It's cold chi. Like you can't touch the stone. So they don't want you to sit. And then you sleep on, you know, plywood. It's not a bed, right? It's not a, these cushy beds were, were trained uh, or were instructed to, to think is the only way to sleep, right? So there's no comfort in, in the way we're used to anyway. And then coming back, one of, the, one of the greatest things that sort of hit me was, you know, I said to myself, you know what? I am going to go sit in that chair. It's not even a particularly comfortable chair. I'm just going to go sit in that and take five minutes to myself and just breathe. Not going to go on my phone. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit there. And it was beautiful. It was such an amazing thing that I didn't get to do at the temple. So it's, it's things like that, which we absolutely take for granted uh, until you experience sort of this militaristic uh, warrior's life, if you will. Uh, you don't really think about that ever. There's no reason to. I could sit in a chair for five hours straight if I wanted to, right? Uh, and do whatever I wanted. So it's, it's just such a different mindset. Uh, besides that, of course, the training. Uh, like I said, thinking that an hour workout was extreme before, is just, it's, that definition has changed for me after doing this, you know, nine hours of training. Uh, it's just sort of adaptation, I think, is one of our greatest strengths as humans. And uh, the fact that I did that on day one, I came off the plane and we had this power training I was describing to you, which is just this absurd, you know, removal of any stamina that you have left. Um, and then some, and for days I was sore and I just said, Oh man, how in the world am I going to do that? This was my first, you know, I was dehydrated coming off the plane. It was 90 something degrees in China. I said, this is crazy. And then, you know, of course, like you said, weeks go by habits sort of, uh, become normalized and it was, it was the normal thing to do to train three hours in the morning. It's all right, let's, let's go eat and let's do it again. Let's train, you know, power stretching in the morning and then we'll have our Wing Chun Sanda class later. Uh, we'll have Tai Chi, Mei Hua Chuan. You know, the list goes on of all the martial arts. Uh, that, that's what we do. We train martial arts. So it was just such a mindset shift uh, of the appreciation and what it means to train in the martial arts. Mm. Wow. You know, I, I, I can imagine myself being there and I can imagine a, a similar experience that I suspect most people who've been training for, for a while yeah, can relate to this. You know, my original black belt test was, was something with a similar philosophy. It certainly wasn't a month long and it wasn't nine hours, but this idea of you go and you think you've hit your breaking point, but you haven't. And they show you that. Right. And it's like, now you're going to spar four people and you're finished. Yeah. I've seen some some black belt tests. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. There was a point where I was hurled and that's the only oh. verb that really works. Wow. <laughs> if you were there, I was hurled. Um, <laughs> when you think about your, your training now, you know, you talked about sitting in the chair, you talked about how you can embrace five minutes and feel really different about it versus five hours in a chair. I think a lot of people listening are used to five hours in a chair, maybe not all in a row, but you know, we know right. what it's like to sit and be maybe absent as we're doing something like that. What's your training look like now? You're training on your own or, or whatever it is that you were, you're, are, are you training in a similar way from before you left for China? Or have you completely changed what you're doing? What, what I'm trying to get to is what does life look like now? You know, we talked about some of the psychological changes, right? but how has that manifested in the variety of things that you do? Well, it's sort of just, it's added to the experience that I have. And a similar thing happened with Everest because think about when you're doing a, like a, a leg workout and you do, let's say what's a set of walking lunges. Like, I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute, you're feeling, you know, 
You're feeling daring a minute and a half. Ooh, very nice. I mean, climbing Everest, I remember one of the jokes I made early on is, and this was a two week straight trek on the Everest trekking route. It was just, you know, so we're pretty much doing walking lunges for, you know, 12 hours straight. That's what this is. <laughs> like just no breaks and that's it. Uh, and uphill. Oh, and you're losing oxygen rapidly. You go higher. So it was a similar thing with that. I came back and now I'm just like, okay, what, what is my leg workout? This is pathetic, you know? <laughs> so it, it was a similar thing to that where now I'll call it the Everest uh, workout. I'll just get on a treadmill and crank up the elevation to absurd levels. And then I'll, I'll push the speed to where it's, you almost have to run, but you can't. That's the rule. So you just have to do this like death march for, you know, as long as you can at almost running speed, but you have to march and uphill. So in a similar way from that, coming back from China, I just said, okay, what is my martial arts training, man? What am I doing? <laughs> like, what is this? I'll do a couple of forms. I'll go through the Wing Chun. I'll go through this. I'll go through that. And, you know, I'll do some kicks. It's just, it feels quite inadequate after, after the experience. So I wouldn't say now I'm mimicking exactly what we did nine hours because I think another thing is we don't have that freedom, right? Most people watching this would agree. You don't have nine hours a day to train unless you give up everything and, and go away to live as a monk, right? You renounce everything. Uh, that being said, that was one of the beautiful things about it was I didn't have to think about anything. I could just train, meditate, exist. Right? It was the simple life has a lot of allure. Uh, but that aside, the training, it just became a lot more open to getting past that limit, right? To sort of breaking through that limit and not worrying so much about the, like I said, I'm a certified trainer, so much about the science that says like, no, 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 you do this for hypertrophy. You must only do this many sets. And you know, that's about it. Uh, the body can adapt to about just, just about anything. After the Everest and China experiences, I, I think that even more than I already did. So I would say it's more of a philosophy shift hmm. uh, than I'm now mimicking exactly what the Shifus showed me in China. But mm -hmm. I think we can all learn from that. Absolutely. Let's talk about Everest mm. first. Well, and we'll work backwards. Did you make it? We did not make it. Yeah. But that was one of the best parts about the journey. So let me make this clear to you. We were going to Everest Base Camp. On, it's okay. the Everest Trekking Group. So this was sort of the great changing moment for me as a human being. It really was one of those moments where you, you can say you're a certain way. Like you can say you're brave, right? But you don't know you're brave until you have that moment right where it's all on the line and you know something terrifying happens do you run away or you know are you brave right you can't really know so in a similar way uh we had this journey and i was with spencer like i said uh my friend who who i went to china with and we were going up the trail and rapidly losing oxygen i mean at certain days you you trek nine miles and you gain i think it was like 2000 feet of elevation in that nine miles. That's so just absolutely rigorous. And similar to the China trip, it's, it's all mental. It's really, I expected some, again, I thought I was Mr. Fitness. Oh, it's going to be, you know, just a really good workout. Absolutely not the case at all. It's, it's just this, it wrecks you mentally. It drives you insane, especially as someone who's into the martial arts and competitive. You walk one step per second you know, just slogging along and it feels like you're sprinting. Your heart rate is, you know, beating through your chest and you feel just so weak and so pathetic. And that's when it takes that, you know, sort of digging down and looking for your true self to keep going. And, you know, at night you'd wake up not being able to breathe, just gasping for air <laughs> and you thinking you're going to die because, you know, you can barely sleep from the lack of oxygen. And it's those things that, I didn't expect. I thought it would be just, oh, this was a, this was a tough workout for a few days. Uh, so that was, that was very difficult. And then when we got to a certain point on the journey, we got to, it was pretty much, we're very close to Everest Base Camp. We're right, right there. I think it was about, it was close to like a mile or two away from it. And we'd reached 17,000 feet elevation. And for those of you who don't have too much experience, in China at the Shaolin Temple, it was about 6,000 feet. And you really feel 6,000 feet. Like your, your stamina is very much degraded. Uh, you know, you jog for five minutes. It, it does not feel like jogging for five minutes. You feel very winded. Um, so it takes, uh, you have to acclimatize. 
to these conditions. It takes, it takes some time. So we were climbing and we got to, like I said, probably a couple miles away. And in the middle of the night, Spencer had really serious altitude sickness, cerebral edema, which is the swelling of the brain. And if not taken care of, you can die from this. And this is how many people do die climbing uh, Everest, Kilimanjaro, you know, these other places is by not taking care of themselves and you have to really get out of there. So our other friend, Mike, who was sort of the climbing expert on the trip said like, we have to, we have to leave now. We have to get Spencer down like five minutes ago. Like he didn't sleep one second all night. You know, he has cerebral edema. We have to go now. And I had about five minutes to get ready to leave. And then Mike said to me, he said, Oh, you know, Phil, you, you can go on. You can go to Everest base camp. It's like, you, you'll, you'll be like, you know, a day ahead of us. And then behind us, you'll have to get there. It's like, you walk so slow, it's close, but yeah, you can do that. You can finish the journey. And then this reaction occurred within me of, you know, this sort of knee jerk reaction of, Oh, like, okay. Like, yeah, I'm someone who finishes what I started. Like it's now my charge to finish this journey. I have to do it for my friends. And I kind of just started, okay, I got five minutes to decide. Let's, let's get ready to do this. You know, uh, my slogan on stream on Twitch is cowards die first. Right. So I was like, okay, cowards die first. We're going, we're going alone. I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never climbed anything. <laughs> I'm going to go to Everest base camp by myself uh, and figure this out. But then, you know, again, the feeling of ambition, right? If like, okay, this will make a great video for content. Think of the title. I did this alone, no training. I'm going to finish this like all by myself and sort of that almost dark side, if you will, again, to, to reference Star Wars, uh, all those, all those things that kind of uh, tempt you. Ooh, okay, glory, ambition, the dark side of what it means to be a goal-oriented person, right? You kind of have to have that within you somewhere deep and kind of suppress it, right? And then I had this moment of, yes, cowards die first, I'm going to do this. Wait a second. Like, why did I come on this trip? Because like, I was having a hard time with something and Spencer said to me like, hey man, why don't you join me with five days notice, by the way, why don't you join me because I think it'll make you feel better, man. Come climb this with me. You're going to feel fantastic. So I said, man, Spencer wanted me to feel better on this trip. My friend is in agony right now. He can't even think straight. His brain is swelling. And I'm about to leave him and go. What, what, am I, what was I even thinking for that, you know, 30 seconds of the dark side sort of entering my brain? So it's like, and, you know, I was even really conflicted as, I, as we turned back. And then, you know, a few minutes later, a couple hours later, we got down a couple thousand feet. Spencer was feeling better. And it dawned on me, he's like, of course. Of course, I was always going to make this choice because that's who I am. All right. So it's just such a, it's one of those moments where you don't know who you are until the moment of truth. And then I think it's so easy. Society has just beaten that into us that you have to finish everything. You have to do this sort of personal glory, this ambition, especially in the entrepreneurial side. Uh, that you know, I think you and I are both involved in. It's it's just so ingrained into that culture. I think it's quite toxic at times. So it was just such a beautiful moment when he turned and said, like, uh, and this is on video. It was such a great moment to capture. He said, like, you know, I can't believe you guys like you relinquished the trip, the end of this journey, like for me, and that means so much to me. Like you're a true friend, and that's what I was like. Of course, I was always going to do this, right? There's no universe where Philip goes there and leaves his friends <laughs> alone in agony and everything. Uh, so it was just such a nice moment. And thinking back, like I said, of course I did that, but you just don't know. So that's what I mean. Are you brave? Are you honorable? You don't know until your opponent is facing you down in that duel. And in this case, it was you know, Mount Everest staring me down, tempting me. Uh, so not at all what I expected from that trip, but what, a, what an experience, what a treasure to come out with pretty powerful and, and i don't think i know anyone who's undertaken anything like that with five days notice it's no pretty, <laughs> did, did people say you were crazy did you tell anyone uh just my family and a couple of friends w was anyone afraid you were going to die yes many people were afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well i remember like i didn't even look into it i didn't even know anything about nepal anything about the tracking route and then I think I remember just seeing one thing that in like an email that he tried to like quickly prep and send to me. And it was like in a couple of years ago, like 40 people died in one day because there was like bad weather <laughs> on this trek. 
And I was like, all right, this is this is pretty serious. But uh, yeah, no, I, like I said, man, cowards die first, which it seems kind of uh, it seems kind of shallow that saying. But I don't literally mean like if you're a coward. It's more, you know, if you don't go for it, if you don't just be brave and jump into it, you kind of die inside, right? You kind of lose that opportunity. Um, if not, you know, you're shamed and mm. all that side of it. So that that was my that was my viewpoint on it. Is I need to do this. I need to do this for people who can't do this, by the way, because I have an open schedule. Most people could never do that. When, when you so, say cowards die first, I am not. I'm not thinking of someone who is, you know, necessarily fearful and, and uh, calculated. I'm thinking of the proverbial squirrel in the road that can't decide which direction to go. Yes. And yeah. the only wrong decision is no decision. And it's right. so controlled by fear and so indecisive that it gets flattened. Yeah, precisely. And uh, it's a, it's a great thing that my, me and my friend came up with while playing a game on Twitch, oddly enough, <laughs> it's a, uh, you know, long story short, it's one of the hardest video games ever created pretty much for the purpose of driving you insane with frustration. It's called dark souls. And you just die over and over and over again. And uh, within the game, and this, this goes into another topic we can get into, but I am very into the classics. Uh, you know, the Iliad, Achilles is, is one of my favorite characters. And this saying sort of comes from Achilles. Because in the Iliad, he, he despises archers. And when I read this, I was like, what? Why does he, why, why does he hate archers so much? Never, it, you know, we're used to seeing Robin Hood, you know, Legolas from Lord of the Rings, all these like cool, you know, Link from the Legend of Zelda, all these cool, uh, you know, sort of fashionably skillful archers. It's like, why, does, why are archers? It's like, why does he hate them so much? I think there's a scene where he's actually crying in a rage. He hates archers so much. Cowards. And I was like, and then he says, he says, they're literally standing on top of a wall safely, you know, and there's men on the battlefield, you know, dueling each other honorably. And they're just like, sniping and picking off people you know, from a safe distance uh let's not fight that legendary hero let's just kill him from safety you know let's not let's not actually test his martial arts and it dawned on me he's like man that is truly cowardly that is disgusting so long story short in this video game which is already incredibly difficult there are some archers amongst the other uh you know enemies and we created this rule it's like no the ultimate cowards cowards die first you have to go and kill the archers First, no matter what, even if you have to run through a hundred swordsmen uh, and spearmen, you know, you have to fight. The, even if you die, you have to try to kill the cat. So it became sort of like the it. slogan. Yeah, yeah. And there's a different meaning behind it. It's, it's a deep meaning if you think about it. It's like, hey, you kind of die inside if you don't go for it. And uh, yeah, you really, we want to sort of not glorify that aspect of it, right? Like, oh, it's not cool to snipe people off and not even enter the battlefield you know, from a safe distance. So yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing, but it actually has kind of a cool meaning behind it. I like it. I like it a lot. Now you, you've talked about Twitch and streaming and, and games, and I know that that's a part of what you do. We were talking about that before we went live. So how do you get from, from martial arts and Everest and, and all of these other things you've, you've talked about, what, what's going on with, with you playing games online and, Spoiler alert, making some money doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it all stems from my love of stories. It's really all that drives me. It's kind of my heartbeat. And I mentioned, you know, my love for Star Wars, my love for the classics. It's been this fascination with the heroic cycle my entire life, the hero's journey, if you will. And if you're not familiar with the classics, like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Argonautica, you know, the list goes on. Star Wars is a great example because George Lucas also is obsessed with the heroic cycle. And the original trilogy and the prequels, not the new stuff, they've long since abandoned the heroic cycle to sell easier. It's, it's the hero's journey. You know, it's a very simple journey of someone who has no skills, you know, being forced out of their home or having to leave their home and you know, meeting these people along the way and gaining these skills as they go, you know, amongst other things. And this, this beautiful arc that occurs of growth. And it's universal. It's in you know, any good story. It's this sort of instinctual reaction. Like it probably contains the heroic cycle, uh, either invisibly or, or quite obviously. So yeah, I've had this fascination with it my entire life. And stuff like going to Everest, stuff like, you know, I also draw, I also make action films. It all stems from that fascination. Uh, but to me, it's all really the same thing, if it makes sense. Like, you know, martial arts, drawing, uh, to use the example of painting, I think that it's all just a paintbrush. I'm just kind of caught in this daydream 
of trying to both tell stories and immerse myself in great stories. Because I really think it is the heartbeat of humanity. Like when, when you see yourself in a story, like why does everybody love Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader? Because we see ourselves, we relate to that uh, on an instinctual level and what it means to grow up and, you know, face down evil. And like I said, in Everest, you know, face down that dark side. And then you come to that point where you have to make a decision. It's like, do I do this? Or in, in one angle, the money, like I could have made a great video and made a lot of money off it. Uh, or do I, you know, is friendship more true to my character? Uh, so yeah, I've had this fascination with it. And as far as painting, I think that like in martial arts, you really, your body is the paintbrush and you're able to just create this beautiful movement uh, and tell this story. Like I said earlier, I think perhaps a more genuine story than, than language, than words can tell with your body body language is so real like it's there's no faking it uh there's no faking martial arts training like you can't really fake certain things like this is why i loved sort of that side of personal training and fitness is you can't really fake a good physique i mean you can you, you can cheat with drugs of course which is disgusting and cowards die first but uh you can't really fake martial arts training like when you see someone do a form uh i competed in one the, the wing chun division in the, the Shaolin Federation international competition in China. That's another fun story. But to see all these other competitors, like you can't fake 20 years of training in something. Like to see my friend Spencer kind of go out there and, and do his thing. It's just such a beautiful experience. It's so, it's so real. You know, it's, it's not some rehearsed thing that he's prepared to look good. It's just 20 years of real training. Like you can see it, you can see the sweat, you can see all those days when he was just like at his breaking point, but kept going. And to me, like that is the personification of the hero's journey of everything that I love. And we you know whether it's me drawing a picture to express that, whether it's me making an action film or going to Everest and you know sort of partaking in my own journey, uh, that's really my heartbeat. That's what keeps me going. So yeah, the gaming is the same thing. I love a good story. Uh, I love sort of the art side of video games, the music. Uh, I also play piano. I'll do you know, gaming music streams on, on Twitch, uh, videos on YouTube. And, uh, to me, that's really all that drives me. I've, I've often been described as just like a daydreamer who once in a while snaps out of it and does something like Everest. And then <laughs> goes back, goes back to my, you know, mulling over stories and creating them, but it's really all I love to do. And, uh, I have this, this sort of dream that it's difficult to define. I don't, I don't really even know what it is. It's just this dream that I chase. I chase this feeling of, of telling stories and sharing the humanity of what we all go through as humans, uh, as people on our own personal journeys. And, you know, whether it goes into like a, a serious look, a philosophical look with one of my films or, you know, something like even action comedy, I just try to share these emotions with everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really all that matters to me. <laughs> you brought up earlier the some of the, the push that the, we'll say the online entrepreneurial culture advocates this, you know, sleep when you're dead and, and all this. And if you're familiar with that and any, any of the listeners are familiar with that, you're probably also familiar with this, this recent shift towards valuing failure and identifying these things that don't work out. Now you're, you're talking about some very exciting opportunities, things that that are popping up. And I get the sense that you say yes to a lot of things, probably darn near everything and just see yeah. where it takes you. Am I, am I right there? Yes. I mean, if it's a great opportunity, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say yes to <laughs> like, you want to go do drugs in the back alley, but yes, if it's a good. And, and there absolutely. are, there are people, probably people listening who are saying, I would rather go do drugs in the back alley than Everest <laughs> in, on five yeah. days notice. Yeah, it might be nicer, honestly. But yeah, not, not my cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go there. I mean, we could, but I want to talk about your failures because everything we've talked about so far today has been, if not successful, it, we've talked about it from a very positive yes. side. I mean, you very easily could have talked about this, this Everest trip from a much more negative perspective. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for two things here. One, I'm looking to get past the, the positive side, which I'm, I'm sure based on who you are and what you've accomplished, that's a big part of who you are. So I want to drill through that a little bit. And I want to talk about some of the things that not only didn't go well, but you're unhappy about them. You 
maybe regret is too strong of a word, but stuff that you're not going to put at the at the top of your resume, sort of stuff. Mm. Absolutely. Well, it, it's fascinating you say that because yeah, those experiences of of failure are some of my most valued times, if you will. Like you know, Everest. That video that I made is. I can't imagine the the joy of watching that in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years to have that encased in time is just such a fantastic thing. And the whole thing is a failure. (laughs) And that's what I'm saying is it's such an important thing. Uh, And other people may have spun that quite negatively. Uh, But for me, it was one of the greatest victories to to know that about myself. Like through a failure, I, I gained that confirmation. And I want to keep stressing that, that we can say we are a certain type of person, but you don't know until you've been tested, right? So that failure for me was incredibly valuable. Um, and even in China, you know, how many of those workouts did I, did I fail, you know, in the traditional definition, I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't complete the workout. I, I felt weak. I felt pathetic in Everest. I couldn't walk for goodness sake. And I've, I am a former division one cross country athlete <laughs> all through my college experience. And I couldn't walk you know, one step per second. What is this madness, right? Uh, absolute failures in, in my previous definition of the word. But in these scenarios, they made me grow so much. Uh, you know, even other shortcomings that I've had in, in this entrepreneurial journey, which if you didn't know, it'll really beat you down. Uh, for our viewers who may have partaken in it, you may know as well. It's just such a ruthless, uh, and, and the media wants you to believe that too. Like we said, yeah, sleep when you're dead. Don't ever rest. You know, it's ridiculous. So I've, I've been beaten down so much, you know, on this journey, but like I said, I just loving that sort of narrative thread of the hero's cycle, the heroic cycle, whatever you want to call it, keeps me going through it. And also realizing in the heroic cycle, most victories, you know, come from some sort of failure as well, or most growth, I should say come from failure. So yeah, I mean, I've failed on Everest uh, completely. I've failed in China. You know, I mean, I won the Wing Chun tournament, which was amazing. But, you know, in, in the basic stances of, you know, Shaolin and Mei Hua Chuan, which has become one of my new favorite martial arts, I couldn't even do the basic stances for weeks. I, I still can't do them. I'm trying to. And, you know, after a, a lifetime of martial arts, to be brought back to that level of failure and sort of beginner feeling is actually fantastic. Like, I enjoy that. I enjoy that so much because you have so much to gain when you're failing at that level, right? It's, you have so many victories to achieve. And, you know, for instance, in my Wing Chun training, which I've, I've basically capped out on, uh, there's not as much of that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can make more subtle victories. Uh, like, you know, I recently trained with my Sifu and I uh, went back and saw him. You know, he, we were working on like micro details in the, in the first form again. We're going back and sort of restructuring uh, to get to an even higher level. But you don't have that, you know, oh, I can finally do this first basic stance feeling. So yeah, for me, there's a lot of that. As far as regrets concerned, um, I do have some, which may surprise some people. I do have quite a bit of it. And it's not so much something that I could control. Uh, on the one hand, you know, we, we, we live and we learn, of course. Like if I had started this journey now, with the knowledge I have, I would do things totally different, as we all would, right? That's, that's not much to say. But, you know, there are, there are mistakes I've made, and I want to make that clear. And I, I always try to be open in all my videos. Like, I never would call myself a master of anything, much less martial arts. Like, you know, maybe on the film end one day or the drawing end, I think I'd be, like, more comfortable, with, you know, 40 years from now calling myself a master. But I don't think I'll ever feel that in the martial arts, uh, especially. It's just too deep. Of a well, right? But uh, yeah, I, I I've made mistakes. You know, I want to make that clear to to everybody. Like, I'm not some. And none of us are. None of us people who have achieved like any sort of victory. Like, I recently hit a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube, which should feel like so, it is like my life's work essentially. And I, I was sort of surprised to not feel much from it, which kind of made me sad. Right? It's like, oh, man, I I wanted to feel some ridiculous dopamine endorphin release here but it's it's also sort of the feeling of the bigger you get the smaller you feel right it's like oh when i had 1000 subscribers 
it felt like, you know, I own the world. I can't believe I did this. I never thought I would do this. But then, you know, going through all those hardships and failures along the way, when you get to a hundred, it's kind of just like, all right, so on to a million, then maybe we'll be something. <laughs> so it's just, you know, things change. So I wouldn't say it's regret necessarily, but along that way, and like I said, on the Everest trip, you have those moments where you get tempted by the dark side, the ambition. Uh, I mentioned I, I just chase this amorphous dream that can't be contained. It can't be defined. I don't even know what it is. I'm just chasing it, hoping that it fulfills me and brings me peace one day. Uh, that has absolutely made me you know, sort of to be true to myself, if you will. I've had to make some very hard decisions in my personal life, in my relationships. Uh, and I've lost people that I might have you know, found happiness with uh, by chasing this dream. Right? But it's sort of the only universal truth that I know. So there's a lot of regret there. But at the same time, much like the decision to turn back from my friends, I think that's who I am. What, what is that dream? If you had to sum it up, because it, it sounds like it's, it's broad and it encompasses it a lot of things. So how, how do you define it? I would say it's, it's definitely vague, but in, in the fact that it's just this, it's a romanticized dream of storytelling, of fulfillment, of, for me personally, finding peace, but also healing people. I think is one of the main things. And like I said, my, for instance, when I make an action film or, or any of the films that I've done, I try to make them very thought provoking, you know, not just like some, some action insanity. Like for example, my ferocity series, which is one of the earlier ones that I still do installments of, I just show extreme violence out of context, two people fighting viciously out of context. And it's just, it's meant to be jarring. It's meant to be disturbing in the fact that it, it, when you see somebody start, you know, if you've ever seen a fight in person, it's very upsetting. It's very disturbing afterwards. Have you ever seen any sort of violence in person? Um, I was in a shooting scare in Penn Station in New York City. It was so upsetting. And people just in the, they thought there was an active shooter. It was kind of like a, somebody let off a stun gun, right? And they thought there was a shooter. And then, you know, telephone, five seconds later, people are yelling, shooter a human stampede occurred and, you know, I'm fine. Cause you know, I, I, like I said, I was a runner and everything. I, I made it out. All right. But I mean, I saw the elderly get trampled. I saw children left to die. People just running and pushing them aside. And it is so disturbing. Um, when you get to that level that we are animals, you know, we are animalistic beasts at the end of the day, we just, you know, civilization paints this, you know, facade over us. Right. To try and organize us and <clears throat> give us a purpose, we all play this collective game called society, right? It's it's a it's a stark reminder. But for instance, in my films, I try to achieve that level of upsetting uh, for the reason to make it thought provoking, and you know, in and then to have some philosophy behind it uh, that we can do better, you know. And if you've been through something like that, you can be healed. You're gonna be all right. And you know, whether it's just a, a comedy piece, like I want to make people feel good. Uh, you know, if not, if not something so, so serious, cause I, I'm a man of extremes. I tend to be either extremely dark, uh, philosophical, deep, or, you know, very light, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a part of the dream is the healing of myself and others through stories. Uh, it's just sort of this romantic cloud that I chase, uh, of those things. And I think the stories are key to it. Like I said, that universal truth and relatability of being able to stare down evil, which you can put anything in that in place of evil, right? In that slot. It could be, you know, is it the Everest conundrum? Is it, you know, do I leave my job to follow my dreams and become an entrepreneur? Do I stay in this relationship because I love this person? Uh, but it may be holding me back. I may be holding them back. Is it selfish to stay with this person if I truly love them? Should I set them free? Uh, you know, whatever evil is, whatever that selfish sort of cowards die first scenario is. Uh, so that, that's it, man. I'm just trying to chase that, but also more importantly, share it with others. And that was, if not feeling such a sort of shallow satisfaction from the hundred thousand subscribers, I did have that at least. Okay. I'm, I'm able to share this with people and hopefully help people now, uh, more than ever on my journey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe it's just to keep growing. So I have some sort of voice and, you know, me and Gabriella talked about this on her podcast too. It's like, 
is it, is it, you know, what, what is this dream? Is it, you know, I get a Netflix deal and I have a movie. Like I doubt I'll be, you know, finished with my dream, right? If I have that, we, we got it now, boys, let's go home. You know, is it Hollywood? Is it this, is it, is it some new platform that doesn't exist? Is it, I just have a video do well on YouTube. Like I doubt it. Right. I think it's just this amorphous feeling of that will never be achieved, but that's what makes it the dream that it is. Right. Mm. And there's, there's a pretty strong corollary there with martial arts. Martial arts Absolutely. Isn't done. Even if you stay in the same style for 80 years, you're not done. There's always more. Yes. Do you think that's part of what resonates for you about martial arts or, you know, is, is this just how you were raised? Because mm -hmm. most people, let's face it, most people like to check boxes. They like to get stuff done and say, yes. I'm done with this. I move on, you know, it, and we're brought up that way, you know, in, in, in most modern societies, you have school grades, you know, and you've yep. finished the requirements and you go on. And even in martial arts, even early on, it's, you know, you do this and you get your blue belt and you move on. and in most of our professional careers, we're expected after, you know, X number of years, you've achieved these certifications or these standards and you move up the corporate ladder. But right. it sounds like nothing in your life has any aspect of that. No, no, it's the endless journey. It really is uh, the endless journey. You just kind of march on and, you know, even like the sword, for example, for my first topic of this conversation. You could never master the sword. And if you did, you've only mastered one style. And then there's so much more there. It, it's the same thing with drawing. Like I said, that's your sword. Uh, you'll never master anything. And if you do, okay, we've mastered, I don't know, some sort of stylized example within drawing or some art form. And with martial arts, it's the same, man. You know, like I said, my Wing Chun is no, by no means any sort of mastery, but I've reached, you know, some level of skill. Um, and, you know, you can, you can assess that for yourself, for those of you watching. But I think I have some level of skill, you know, after a decade. And, but, you know, what is that? Is it, is it as good as, as my teacher? Absolutely not. Is it as good as his teacher? Absolutely not. Uh, who was the son of Yip Man? No. So I don't think we'll ever achieve any sort of ending. But I think, like you said, society trains us to lie to ourselves that we have. And I think I'm just not willing to do that. I'm a little more willing to be. Uh, someone who is not so keen on labels, I say like, that's completed. I'm a master. I'm this, I'm that. Like, I, I can't do it. And it makes me incredibly uncomfortable to do it. Uh, like I said, I'll never call myself a master. So I love the endless journey though. That's me personally. I think a lot of people, they want that dopamine release to say I'm done. But also like even the school I went to for Wing Chun, there's no system. There's no politics. There's no levels of belts. There's no level of achievement that can be had. It's just, if he, if uh, Russ Sichan, my Sifu, thinks you're uh, doing well enough, he'll show you the next part. And that's it. So maybe it's even that uh, that appealed to me of that particular school. But uh, I, I love it. I love the endless journey. And maybe it goes back to the heroic cycle, um, to you know Gilgamesh, the Ramayana, all these stories that I love and have enjoyed. There are so many lessons in that. And, you know, even like we look at Heracles or Hercules, uh, the Roman version, you know, his, his end is not some beautiful you know, victory. I don't know if you know how Hercules dies, but I mean, he's wrongly accused of cheating on his wife and then, you know, is poisoned and rips trees out of the ground, builds his own funeral pyre and, you know, jumps on it and has like his friend lighted for him and you know it's sort of even that ending is is part of the journey that he didn't like finish do you know what i mean there's no oh we did it boys let's go home to say what i said earlier uh that that's what i love about it uh you know another person miyamoto musashi is another one of my uh favorites if you read the book of five rings i'm sure our viewers are into such things check it out if you haven't uh i just love it you know if you look at his his sort of tenets for life very harsh, uh, you know, not comforting <laughs> way to live your life. Uh, but it, it's sort of in that same theme, I think, of, uh, you know, we, we're chasing something that cannot be defined. We're trying to better ourselves. But, you know, we're not, we're not some god. Uh, we're not some complete being. And to me, that, that, is, that is life. That is a journey. And I'm, I'm interested in exploring that. If you were to look forward, let's, let's put a couple 
signposts in your journey. You know, let's look out a year, 10 years, and 50 years. What would you want to be able to say about each of those points in time? With a year, I would say I would like to, and, and similar to that Everest decision, sort of reaffirmed or confirmed who I am as a human being. A little bit more, just one step further would be nice to have that confirmation. Uh, you know, and it could be any, any numerous ways, but I think for, for me, that character that is so important, sort of that who you are when no one's watching character, I would like to get uh, another proof of who I think I am. As far as the 10 years, I would want to be much further along on that same journey and also perhaps grasped my dream a little bit more, perhaps defined it a little bit easier. And then I think on the 50 years, I would love to have found some peace, a place that I can really call home, a place that I can find peace, and to be able to have helped a lot of people heal and feel better about uh, those similar aspects of themselves, to, to have confirmed and felt comfortable with who they are in this sort of chaotic world that we live in. Uh, to help them deal with some trauma they've had in their life, you know, physically or mentally. And to have really taken some strides forward uh, to that dream. And rather than chasing the dream so much, perhaps to have, you know, uh, called it more of a friend. To sort of walk uh, hand in hand with it in stride. I think that would be fantastic. Thank Where can you. people find you? You threw out a lot of stuff. I'm sure there's a long list, but let's, let's give them the highlights. Well, my big, uh, my biggest thing is YouTube, of course, like I said, very exciting. We just reached hundred K subscribers and I've been putting out the content from this China trip. There's a ton of it. <laughs> so there's a lot more to come as well, but it's just youtube.com slash Phil Hartshorn. You want to look it up. Uh, and then that's sort of my big long form, big production stuff and my fight scenes and films. We also do drawing and gaming, but Instagram is sort of this, the best way to get in touch with me. And it's the best way to see like my short fun stuff uh, because, you know, it's minute long videos. Uh, and it, it's the same thing. Just my name, Philip Hartshorn on Instagram. Uh, you know, send a message if you have any questions. Be glad to help out. Twitch, of course, if you want to chat live is amazing. Same exact thing. Just Philip Hartshorn, my name, no spaces. And, uh, you know, we'll do drawing streams. We'll, we'll talk about all this, all this stuff that we've rambled on about in this <laughs> interview. Uh, I'll play music. We'll play games. You want to play Smash Bros with me and Speaking of martial arts, you know, fight me in a virtual world. That'd be fun. I usually do that with my viewers. So, uh, yeah, those are, those are the big three, I would say. I'm also on Facebook and, and all the others, but it's essentially just, you know, the same content repurposed. So come say hi on anything. Always glad to chat, answer questions, and uh, support you guys as well. Awesome. Awesome. And, of course, we'll have links to our, at our show notes for anybody that might have missed any of that or drive it Thank or you. whatever. Thank you. Thank you. And let's let's wrap up the show here. You know, you've been pretty forthcoming with advice and thoughts through this whole conversation, but let's let's try to pin it down to a single nugget, if you will. What parting words would you leave everyone with today? I think, you know, to to circle back around, I would say that cowards die first is a great way to look at life, if not live by it, you know, as all, all jokes aside. Uh like you mentioned earlier, I, I appear to have said yes to a lot of absurd scenarios, really. Five days, no prep, go to Everest. Uh, China, I think, I think it was a week notice. Uh, but that has led me to such wonderful realizations and has led me to such uh, opportunities and just friendships, uh, to name one of the most fulfilling ones, and, and fulfillment and joy reflection like you know the meditation in china or on everest just standing at the top of the world highest place on earth and being able to think about who i am as a person and you know where i want to be in my life uh it's just it can't be valued it's incredibly valuable so no i'm not saying go to everest but try living your life by that cowards die first uh philosophy and try just just saying yes to something that you feel that pang of fear at first but then say you know what would I wish I had done, you know, when I'm on my deathbed, uh, 
as intense as that is, that's how I tend to live my life. And uh, if it sounds like something you'd be interested in, give it a try. Cowards die first. Talk about stories, right? I mean, this man's done a lot of great stuff. But what I liked most was the why. You could see at every stage why he was doing things. And I really appreciate that. It's important that we all find our why, not just broadly, but specifically. When you undertake something, what's the reason? Thank you for coming on the show, for sharing all of these things, Mr. Hartshorn. I hope we get to talk again. If you want the photos and the links and the, everything else from this episode, from every other episode we've ever done, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you haven't been there in a while, go check it out. There's always new stuff going up there. And you know what we update even more than that site? Whistlekick.com. From the blog to the store to links to the other things. It is our digital hub, our virtual storefront. And you can find a lot of things there. If you want to know what's going on, best way to do that, sign up for the newsletter. There should be a pop-up at either website for you. If you want to give us a hand, make a purchase. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% or follow us on social media. Share the things that we do. Leave reviews. Show us some love. We're doing everything we can for you and for the rest of the traditional martial arts community. And when you help us out, it helps us out. It helps us help other people. If you've got a guest suggestion, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There's a form over there. Fill it out. Let us know. And follow us on social media at Whistlekick. Or you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.